Hello and welcome to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. We are very excited to have in our studio today someone who has been a guest on our show before. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Janice Hahn. How are you, Congresswoman? Good, Derek. It's good to be with you again. Well, it's great. Yes, I have a photo in my office from the last time, so uh, it's always a pleasure. And it's I nice. know you have many things pulling at your calendar, so thank you. I'm always pleased to be here, and I'm sure. my first time in your new studio. Yes, yes, it is. So uh, as we do this show, outside it's in the 90s, extremely hot. But what's the climate in Washington, D.C., politically speaking, as you come home this trip? Well, I think in my entire life I have not seen the kind of uh, really disarray and dysfunction uh, that we're seeing in Congress currently. And mm -hmm. when you have the majority party unable to elect the Speaker of the House, <laughs> then you sort of wonder uh, how in the world are we going to actually you know, advance legislation mm -hmm. that can mm -hmm. help the American people. So mm -hmm. uh, it was completely dysfunctional when I left right. last week. Well, did, was that, uh, for you who's working there, was that as big a surprise to you guys there as it was to the rest of us in the United States to start to hear that play out? Well, I think we were all surprised first when John Boehner, right. uh, the day yes. after the Pope came, uh, yes. announced his resignation, mm -hmm. that he was going to be leaving Congress and leaving the job of Speaker mm -hmm. of the House at the end of October. Right. And then, you know, to have the assumed frontrunner, Kevin McCarthy from California, <laughs> right, exactly. also announced that he was withdrawing his name from mm -hmm. uh, the race for speaker. Mm -hmm. I think we were all surprised, uh, as right. everybody was. Now, I know you don't have, uh, you're not clairvoyant to know what was in their minds, but when you think about Mr. McCarthy, uh, why would you think he would not want to do it? Would there be any particular reasons that come to I, mind? I think Kevin M McCarthy probably saw what was happening within his own Republican caucus right, that right. he was probably going to have the same problems that John Boehner was having right. and that there is a faction mm -hmm. uh, in their caucus that frankly you know uh, was going to give Kevin trouble and that right. he was going to have difficulty getting to the 218 votes that he would need to become right. Speaker of the House. So I think he mm -hmm. Uh, took one for the team and said, <laughs> I guess I'm not the guy to right. lead uh, this party. So right. I, I just uh, think he wanted to save himself the same problems that John Boehner has yeah. been experiencing. Sounds like a smart move for him, at least personally, because it's one thing to go to work, but the stress that you must be under, when, when I think about the responsibility, I mean, with thousands and millions of people collectively as a nation, that's a tremendous responsibility, and you have to have your heart 100% in it. You do, but you also, I, I think what's um, troubling uh, to me, and I'm sure it is to the American people, is that you seem to have a Congress that really uh, doesn't want to work together. No. There's zero cooperation between both sides, and I think this fight for speakership really mm -hmm. proved it that the mm -hmm. Republican Party right now is very divided mm -hmm. in, in their agenda, mm -hmm. uh, and many of them don't want to work with the Democrats and don't right. want to compromise on any piece of legislation. And I think that's what's frustrating to the American people. And I'm sure that's why uh, yeah. we have a very low approval rating. Yeah, I was, uh, before the show, I was mentioning that I was in Alabama. And uh, the whole perspective on politics in the South seemed to be, you know, even more staunch in terms of what they want versus what they don't want. And I can only imagine that gets magnified at a higher level once you get to Congress and get those states collectively there. I think what we're seeing is sort of a collective anger mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. the public's uh, mm -hmm. view uh, mm -hmm. that they're, they're, they're tired of this kind of partisan politics and they right. really want us to work together right. to solve their problems and to right. put forward an agenda that actually improves people's lives. Yeah. So uh, it'll be interesting to see whether or not <laughs> uh, the new Speaker of the House is able to bring both sides together. Right. As you think about then taking this maybe to the international level for a moment, we have uh, our relations with Iran, we have new relations with Cuba. Uh, what are your thoughts? And then we have immigration as an issue, multiple things and, and different perspectives. Uh, what are your thoughts on, let's start with Iran uh, and, and Cuba relations. What are your thoughts in that regard? Well, you know, I, I was one of the members of Congress that voted in favor of 
the agreement to um, prohibit Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. I know it was a very controversial right. agreement. Uh, we, there were two sides to that story. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think at the end of the day, after I'd been briefed on it, I'd, I'd read the document, I'd gone to the, you know, the secure location to, mm -hmm. to read the, mm -hmm. some of the text of the agreement. At the end of the day, uh, you know, this agreement is not about trusting Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, which we're probably never going to do, but right. it was about putting into place, by the way, with, with uh, five other major uh, forces right. in, in the international community, right. an agreement that you know, pretty much right. told Iran, you're not going to get a nuclear weapon, and mm -hmm. you're not going to get it because we are going to have the most uh, comprehensive inspection right. that has ever been allowed uh, in any other uh, country, so right. I think uh, our, you know, as in 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 uh, in that agreement, you know, we uh, agreed to Iran's, you know, demands that some of their uh, the sanctions be relieved, some of their right. assets would become unfrozen, uh, but in return, you know, right. they had to to agree to not acquire a nuclear weapon. So right. I think going forward, uh, we're certainly going to have many more eyes on the ground and yeah. watching what they're doing and before that hasn't happened. So I'm hopeful, right. cautiously optimistic, right. you know, that this agreement will at the end of the day make uh, not only the Middle East a safer region, but certainly right. will protect our national security as well. Which is important, as you said, it's, it's a national and international uh, issue as well. And I, I would imagine uh, when you talk about uh, Iran as well, I mean, we're talking about a culture there that believes that they're absolutely right in what they believe and we're absolutely right in what we believe and so it seems that we've come to the best possible agreement that we could with that understanding. I think so. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when I looked at the alternative, right. uh, I didn't like that alternative right. uh, because, you know, under the previous presidential administration, under the Bush administration, they were zero tolerance, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. you know, no... Right you know, weapons, mm -hmm. you know, acquiring no enrichment of mm -hmm. uranium, and yet uh, they went from about 6,000 centrifuges to 19,000 under that zero, zero <laughs> tolerance <Okay. laughs> uh, of okay. nuclear weapons. So I, right. I thought that was, that's not working. Right. And when they told me that they were within, you know, three months of mm -hmm. uh, having the bomb, uh, you know, I, th I thought right. this agreement really put into play something a little more secure, Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's not based on trust, right. and it's not based on hope, it's right. based on verification, and it's based on the international community uh, right. really making sure that those inspectors know mm -hmm. exactly what's going on there. Now if we flip the script then to Cuba, more of a positive move in terms of relations there, uh, not far off of our coast, what were your thoughts when you saw that evolve? You know, I agreed with uh, President Obama, who said, you know, the, the the policy that we've had for the last 50 years also hasn't worked. We've right. had the embargo, we've had uh, sanctions, uh, and still there were still so many things that were not evolving like I'm sure everyone mm -hmm. had hoped for. Mm -hmm. So I think his idea of uh, opening up uh, relations, having an embassy uh, in Cuba. Uh, and, and really still saying, we can do this while we condemn your mm -hmm. you know, human rights violations, we condemn those, mm -hmm. but in the meantime, we think uh, there should be more opportunity for the Cuban people. Right. And there were so many uh, families uh, who really were looking forward to uh, just more of uh, you know, trade, more travel, right. uh, more sort of normal relationships with Cuba. And it sounds like that that was well received for the majority uh, of, of Americans. And I, I was on the flight recently and I heard people talking about booking uh, trips to Cuba soon. So it sounds like people are excited about it. I the think relations. they are. And so I, yeah. I agree with the president's strategy that yeah. uh, what we were doing for 50 years wasn't working. Right. Let's try this. Uh, imagine that, huh? I know. <laughs> After 50 years of trying. So. Uh, more uh, domestically than the uh, Equality Act and, and the legislation about the discrimination against LGBT uh, individuals in housing, employment, and other areas of life. And I, I know that was something that you were also supportive of as well. 
You know, of course, I, I just think this country, uh, many years ago when we were, uh, our forefathers were, you know, hammering out uh, our, you know, constitution and what we believed in and what was important to us. I'm sure not every scenario mm -hmm. entered their, their right, minds. Right. But I think bottom line is we believed in the equality of all people and that under the law, uh, everyone should be treated equally and really, uh -huh. Anytime we see discrimination of any, uh, of women, of minorities, of LGBTQ uh, members of our community, you know, mm -hmm. that's not right. And mm -hmm. no matter how you believe, uh, you know, in your own, you know, life, right. we've right. got to believe that everybody deserves to be treated equally under right. the law. And I stand up for that, and I believe in that, and I think right. that's what makes us a great country. Especially when, uh, when you think about how, how diverse this country is and people come from other nations and, and other cultures but also people who just grow up here and just have different beliefs so I applaud you for being so open-minded and, and And you know the more we uh, lift those kinds of discrimination policies right. I think the less we're gonna see the bullying of our young people uh, because when it's okay in a society to discriminate um, against different people, then you're mm -hmm. going to see people being harassed and humiliated and bullied uh, mm -hmm. as young as elementary school. So right. we need to make sure that we believe all people are equal and right. all people deserve to be treated with respect and dignity under our law. Absolutely. And speaking of young people, I, I was reading that you had discussions with uh, Sheryl Sandberg, the uh, Facebook COO, and uh, uh, Lean In mm -hmm. uh, about uh, confidence in young women and building that confidence. So can you share uh, quickly before we go to break just some insight on that conversation? You know, she's such an inspirational uh, figure. She's uh, written the book uh, mm -hmm. Lean In, and her concept is, you know, more women need to uh, you know, understand their power, understand their their unique gifts and qualities, and have the confidence, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever walk of life they find themselves in, to really rise to the top. Right. And it's true. I think there are many women still in various walks of life that mm -hmm. don't see the opportunity or have not grasped their pathway to excellence and leadership. Uh, we should have more women CEOs. Yes. We should have more women uh, mm -hmm. in politics. I hope we have a woman in the White House someday. There you go. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. I, her concept is we should be trying at all levels to right. really empower uh, women to know their full uh, strength and value. Right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. As you can see, the Congresswoman has lots of insight. Uh, stay with us, uh, and we'll be back with more of Long Beach Lens. <music> Here live in the mix at the Pacific Ballroom here at the Long Beach Arena. Well, I think it's one of the most spectacular things we've had in Long Beach for years and years and years and years. This space looks like you could do anything. I think it's already created a buzz and an action and excitement for the downtown area. Welcome back. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson on Long Beach Lens. Joining us is Congresswoman Janice Hahn. And Congresswoman, as I was uh, looking at, I believe it was maybe your Facebook page, and uh, the Pope had arrived, and I saw him walking down through Congress, and I noticed, I believe it was a red jacket or something to that effect, and I thought, hey, I know her, and, and there you were. Tell us about that experience 
was really exciting to yeah. be a member of Congress when this Pope, Pope Francis, came, first Pope in the history to address a joint session of Congress. Wow. And so I figured Probably out how to get on the aisle. <laughs> and, uh, you were there early, huh? I was there early. <laughs> but it's interesting because they said he, he was on a very tight timeline. So uh -huh. they were like, don't shake his hand, don't right, talk right. to him, we need to get him in, give a speech, he needs right. to get out. He had a full day. Yeah. Uh, so I saw him, just like the president does when he mm -hmm. gives the State of the mm -hmm. Union, uh, comes down the center aisle, and I noticed everyone, they even had blockers to keep members of Congress right. from talking to him or touching him. Okay. And I thought to myself, you know, this is not like a Catholic church. He's not talking <laughs> to his bishops, his priests, right. his, uh, you know, the people he, he feels comfortable with. This is the first time he's addressed the governmental body of the United States of America. It seemed to me he looked a little mm -hmm. like, wasn't sure how he would be received. Right, right. So I decided to uh, right. say something to him right. and welcome him. And I could tell right. he turned and really sort of lit up. Yeah. And he was, I think he was grateful that one of us spoke to him. We, right. were, <laughs> we were being so polite and told right. not to speak to him that I think right. he was feeling a little insecure about maybe yeah. how we were receiving him. Right. And the fact of the matter is, everybody I knew was very excited uh, right. to see him. We, I wanted him to feel welcome, so right. that was what I was doing. And it's right. a great photo where yeah. he's actually smiling at me. Oh, that's very uh, cool. But more importantly, his speech, I think, to Congress was extremely um, important. Mm -hmm. um, it was w well thought out. And I think he mm -hmm. said some things that we as members of Congress needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And do you think from a congressional side that for the most part that it was well received? I think well? it was extremely well per, per, yeah. uh, received. He had a little something for both sides. Right. Uh, right. But uh, I think he was very clear on just kind of reminding us, you know, what our responsibility was. He, he, mm -hmm. he didn't scold us. Right. He didn't lecture us. Right. He sort of appealed to our better angels, mm -hmm. our, our better nature, mm -hmm. and encouraged us to, to really be better, to do more, to to be concerned for the poor. Uh, but I think the, the, you know, that what got me, particularly in that body, was he sort of said it all boils down to you know, the golden rule. You know, treat others mm -hmm. like you want to be treated. And he sort mm -hmm. of said that's, how, that's the bar that we should use when we discuss all policy, all legislation, all mm -hmm. major you know, agendas that we have. Mm -hmm. How would you like to be treated? And yeah. think of that when you're, mm -hmm. when you're doing things. So I thought about it in terms of the broader issues of immigration reform, mm -hmm. gun violence, mm -hmm. but I also mm -hmm. thought of it in just in the way we treat each other as members of Congress. Yeah. You know, be kind, you know, <laughs> reach, re yeah. reach across the aisle, mm -hmm. try to figure out what the other person's going through, walk in their shoes a little bit, and yeah. uh, it was a very poignant message. I know I took it to heart. I know that um, if, if you talk uh, scripture, there is one uh, about, uh, you know, accepting things with the innocence of a child's uh, mm -hmm. heart and mind. And, mm -hmm. and I think when you strip away egos and logos and titles, et cetera, mm -hmm. and just approach someone on, on a basic human level, uh, that much more could be done if, if we could just find a way to do that. And I think he was the perfect person to give that message right. because he is that. Right. He's a very humble, mm -hmm. simple a plain-spoken man, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, he really, by his actions, mm -hmm. uh, was gave himself, you know, the credentials to be able to give that message yeah. because he goes to the prisons, he mm -hmm. talks to people, he lifts up the children as they walk along, right. you know, when they come to to see him. Yeah. Uh, he he speaks to everyone, um, and uh, I, I think his. His message was well received. His visit, I thought, was spectacular in the United States yeah. of America. I think he did a lot of good. Speaking of children, there was a, a child from, I believe, your congressional yes. district, uh, Sophie Cruz, right. that actually approached him. So your district was really on point. We were there right there. there. <laughs> yes, right. We we were right there. Yes, when yeah. he uh, came down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in his in his motorcade in his right. Pope mobile. Right. Um, again, he has sort of the equivalent of Secret Service yeah. around him. Yeah. He certainly has bodyguards. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a little girl who her uh, family had put her over the barricades <laughs> and sort of, you know, go, go see the Pope. And she, right. you know, went to the Pope and, and 
the bodyguards didn't keep her away. Really? They picked oh. her up, and she uh, said something to the Pope and uh -huh. gave him a T-shirt, which uh, had uh, the, the letters D-A-P-A -A on it, which is DAPA, which is Deferred uh -huh. Action for Parents of American uh -huh. Citizens. Okay. And Sophie is the perfect example of why we need to do immigration reform. She is an American citizen, but her parents are not. And currently, under our law, her parents could be deported mm -hmm. uh, because they came here illegally. And mm -hmm. is that really mm -hmm. what we, is that the principle we want to put forward, that we want to split right. up a family like that? Right. And by the way, they traveled all the way from, from Southgate mm -hmm. uh, to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. to try to get a glimpse of the Pope. And, and they got more than a glimpse. Yes, they, they did. They got a moment, wow. like I did, with the Pope. Wow. Wow, that had to be special for them as a family, and especially it, in the midst of the crisis that they're exactly. facing. Exactly, and yeah. it, it was—it's a good talking point to, right. to talk. There's a perfect example of a little girl whose right. parents could be deported, and that's right. why we need comprehensive immigration reform. We need to fix that. That's right. broken. Right. And how? What are we going to do? And how are we going to fix it? Right. Well, with leadership like yours, I'm sure it'll continue to get the. Well, we're trying. The, the focus, unfortunately, we see. In another perspective, people talking about building walls and, and doing other things. So let's hope again that we can strip away and get down to the human cause that we're, we're speaking of. Well, it goes back to yes. treat others like you would like to be right. treated. That's the thing. If that was you mm -hmm. in, in another country, how would you mm -hmm. like to be treated? Absolutely. Uh, speaking of, of people um, being um, treated the proper way, uh, I know that there is another passion of yours, and that's the uh, raising of the minimum wage and uh, because it's the right thing to do. And uh, I read an article where one business owner says, it may be the right thing to do, but it's not for us as a small business uh, to have to suffer in that process. But what are your thoughts on the raising of the minimum wage? And, and what would you say to small businesses that feel that that's going to adversely impact their growth as well? Well, we know that um, the minimum wage right now is so low mm -hmm. that um, you know, a, a, a person cannot really survive on the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And again, the minimum wage right now doesn't just apply to teenagers getting a summer job. Mm -hmm. I mean, many uh, heads of the family are mm -hmm. making minimum wage. They're trying to support their family mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, hopefully someday even, you know, send their kids to college. Right. And the minimum wage does not uh, buy you very much in no, that respect. No. So we haven't raised the minimum wage in a long time. I think mm -hmm. it's time to raise the minimum wage. And we heard that in the city of LA when we instituted the living wage many right. years ago. And we heard the sky is falling, yes. businesses will leave, this yeah. is terrible for the economy. And none of that really panned out. Mm -hmm. um, what it does is uh, you know, lift the quality of life for so many people and it lifts them out of poverty. Because by the way, poverty also costs yes. uh, the rest of us money. Yes. And uh, it's, a, it's a better idea to pay people a decent wage that they can live on. And I believe, uh, you know, even for small businesses, you know, it's going to be a phased in uh, process for the city of LA and the county is looking at $15 an mm -hmm. hour, but it's going to be phased in over five years. So it won't be a huge hit on small businesses. And I also would say, you know, a lot of small businesses tell me that, um, you know, the what costs the money is employees who leave, right. the turnover, yeah. having to retrain, retrain people. Right. That's mm -hmm. where it costs the money. So mm -hmm. if you pay people a decent wage, you're probably mm -hmm. going to have employees who will stay uh, yeah. a, a lot longer. The, the, and there's a lot to be said, I know, even for us as a nonprofit agency, about uh, the loyalty of the staff that you have, the institutional knowledge that they have right. with your company. So That's that they worth can, a lot. Absolutely. It's, it's actually, in my mind, priceless when you are especially working on a tight budget and, and all the, the customer service impact that that could have as well. So and, I you know, agree. those of us who believe in, in raising the minimum wage also believe that that's more money in the pocket of mm -hmm. people who will then spend that money mm -hmm. uh, back into the economy and help small businesses. Because one of the biggest complaints I hear from my small business owners is they want more customers. Right. <laughs> they, they, that's what they want. Yes. They, they want more customers. Yeah. And you get more customers by giving more people in our society money that mm -hmm. they can spend with small businesses in their communities. Now, 
we just mentioned poverty and we were talking about that and as you know we are a community action agency and uh, we receive community service block grant funds and uh, we were talking before about the HR 1655 and that's to reauthorize uh, community service block grant funding but when you think about agencies like us that serve those who are in poverty and you think about legislation such as this that would be supportive uh, what are your thoughts in that regard? Well it's really a great way for um, federal government to get money mm -hmm. uh, to communities, mm -hmm. uh, to nonprofits mm -hmm. who are directly impacting the lives of so many people. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is right now, it doesn't sound like uh, things are moving very quickly in Congress, right. but certainly right. I'm supportive of reauthorizing that because right. when you walk me around the studio and show mm -hmm. me uh, everything you're doing here mm -hmm. that maybe many people don't even know, right. reaching out to so many young people at risk and giving them, you know, skills, giving them mm -hmm. skills to pay their bills. Absolutely, I, I love that phrase, <laughs> Which yes. is yes. so critical, mm -hmm. and again, mm -hmm. that helps our, our mm -hmm. communities, that helps mm -hmm. our cities, that helps our states, and mm -hmm. it helps our country. And, mm -hmm. and government can't do it all, right. and we really depend on nonprofits to yeah. help with the outreach um, mm -hmm. that can actually save lives and turn lives around, which is exactly what you're doing. So that would be money well spent. Uh, yeah. I'm for reauthorizing that. I'm a little, you know, mm -hmm. frustrated at mm -hmm. um, the actual reality of whether or not that's going to happen. But I'm supportive yeah. of that. Thank you. And as, as we uh, tape this show, uh, most of the staff that you see behind the scenes here are actually interns that are, you know, working on college degrees in this particular profession. And some have actually gone from being interns to employees in various sectors. So we as an agency see it as being very important. And as you said, I don't think it's for government to do it all. Right. Uh, I don't think they should. Right. And I think that when you have agencies such as us involved, it also helps to make that connection with the community where if they had mistrust of the government for any reasons, right. they already have relationships with agencies such Absolutely. as us, so that works out. We're gonna take another quick break, and when we come back, we want to talk about, uh, continue our conversation with the Congresswoman and talk about gun violence because she has strong uh, opinions on that and beliefs, and we want to share them with you. So stay tuned for more of Long Beach Lens. My name is Tari Shakur. I'm a youth organizer with Youth Justice Coalition. Our 1% campaign focuses on taking 1% of the budget used for LAPD, LA City Attorneys, Sheriffs, County, and Probation. This equals to $100 million a year. That's enough to fund 25,000 youth jobs, 50 youth centers, and 500 peace builders in schools and on the street, therefore decreasing the school to prison pipeline and mass incarceration of people of color in general. Visit youthforjustice.org to learn more about the campaign and get involved. Artful Thinking is a Long Beach based nonprofit founded in 2010 to create artful events that educate the public about HIV and breast cancer while raising funds to support those services. Since then, we have brought Long Beach two successful comedy nights with Paula Poundstone and the monthly film series Out at the Movies, which featured appearances by Lily Tomlin as well as others. Beneficiaries include the Woman to Woman campaign in Long Beach the Christina Applegate Foundation, St. Mary's Hospital's Care Program, the AIDS Assistance Foundation, the AIDS Food Store. Contact us at info at artfulthinking.org. Thank you. There's been another mass shooting in America, this time in a community college in Oregon. That means there are more American families, moms, dads, children, whose lives have been changed forever. But as I said just a few months ago, and I said a few months before that, and I said each time we see one of these mass shootings, our thoughts and prayers are not enough. It does not capture the heartache and grief and anger that we should feel. And it does nothing to prevent this carnage from being inflicted someplace else in America. We spend over a trillion dollars 
and pass countless laws and devote entire agencies to preventing terrorist attacks on our soil, and rightfully so. And yet, we have a Congress that explicitly blocks us from even collecting data on how we could potentially reduce gun deaths. How can that be? Welcome back to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson. Joining us is Congresswoman Janice Hahn. And Congresswoman, as we listen to that clip from the president, I uh, think about facts that I read where in 1,004 days there were 994 mass shootings in America, and of those, 150 school shootings since 2013. And you were mentioning during that clip that the president was really visibly upset and moved by that. What are your thoughts when you hear well, these facts? We should all be visibly yes. upset yes. Uh, by every incident of gun violence in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, but the president is usually uh, calm and cool, and you <laughs> could tell that this one really um, was sort of not the tipping point, but he's so angry that right. we in Congress refuse to legislate anything mm -hmm. that would help reduce gun violence in mm -hmm. this country. You know, we have more guns in this country than people. And... Uh, <laughs> there's really a fact that says that. Wow. Yeah, there, there's That's a fact incredible. that says that. And I think there's a lot of us that would like to do common sense yes. legislation yes. that would prevent gun violence. Yes. Everybody believes in the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Everybody believes you, everybody mm -hmm. has a right. A law-abiding citizen has a mm -hmm. right to own mm -hmm. a gun. But we feel like there are certain things we could put in place that might reduce some of these Mm -hmm. uh, mass shootings. For instance, uh, the, the loophole when people buy guns at a gun show. Uh, there ought to mm -hmm. be universal background checks mm -hmm. and definitely at gun shows there ought, there ought to be background checks. Mm -hmm. There's also a loophole with the Brady Law mm -hmm. which says that if you're uh, purchasing a gun and you've got your application in for a background check mm -hmm. and it doesn't happen, it's pending, in mm -hmm. three days you get your gun anyway. Hmm. Uh, so there's a big loop, loophole that we could right. close. Right. And then I, I think we all need to realize that mental um, health is a right. huge issue in this country. Uh -huh. And people with mental health challenges uh, probably shouldn't have access to guns. Yeah. And we need to do more to, to really find these people in our communities who need help. Mm -hmm. Find these people. Sometimes it's obvious in school. Mm -hmm. uh, that we could, should do a better job of getting help to people who really have mental challenges. Mm -hmm. But I think some of those common sense things, yeah. I think even, you know, something like 90% of gun owners, responsible gun owners in this country agree mm -hmm. with those solutions that I just presented. So yeah. w w I think we, we need to do something. Yeah, I was, uh, again, going back to my trip in Alabama. When you grow up in, in my hometown, for instance, Mobile, Alabama, most guys do, are doing two things. They're hunting and they're fishing, you know. And so when they hear anything about taking away possibly their right to bear right. arms, uh, they need to understand that we're not talking about right. banning yeah. guns. We're, right. we're talking about a responsible way of going about this. Right. right? Yeah, in no yes. way are we talking about taking people's guns away. Right. We just think uh, that if someone is going to purchase a gun, mm -hmm. we need to do a background check so we can keep guns out of the hands of those who are mentally ill, right. of those who have a uh, violent uh, history, right. they have a, a history of domestic abuse. Right. I mean, these are just things we should find out and keep guns mm -hmm. from being in their hands. That's all, you know, I think those of us who want mm -hmm. common sense. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a task force in Congress that has come up with some of these common sense solutions to prevent mm -hmm. gun violence in this country, and it goes nowhere. Uh, it, it, there's just not a political appetite mm -hmm. uh, to actually enact any of these um, uh, legislation. Uh, I mean, you, you've said common sense several times, and it, it does. It just seems like common sense, and yet it must be very frustrating to you and others to, to know that something should just be a simple decision, and yet nothing seems to be very simple when you talk about Well, when we had those... Uh, you know, 20 school children yes. who were six years old in right. first grade at mm. Sandy Hook. I, I thought then, I thought, okay, this is really it. That will do it. Yeah. This will do it because no, 
you know, right. human being will be able to look right. at those facts and see kids in elementary school who were gunned down. Mm -hmm. Surely we can do something mm -hmm. to prevent something like that from happening in the future. And uh, no, it, di it didn't, didn't no. help. We have parents, we have people across this country who are begging us to do something and mm -hmm. there is just no appetite to pass legislation. That's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope with your leadership and, and others that uh, join you that we can make movement there because uh, un until it happens to you, it's sort of like when I uh, was diagnosed with cancer two years ago, you see all the commercials and you see the you know pink month, et cetera. But when you hear those words, you know, and it relates to you, or when it's your loved one that's impacted by that violence, it's unfortunate that it takes that for some people to get their real attention. But uh, we hope that with leadership such as yours and others that we can make movement because something really needs to be done. I agree, yeah. and I'm going to continue to fight for that. I'm going to continue to talk about that. But, you know, we need the American people yes. to rise up right. and Absolutely. let their legislature mm -hmm. No, they're yeah. a member of Congress. They need to let them know what they want. In right. fact, People Magazine uh, printed all of our names and all of our phone numbers <laughs> in their last issue and basically uh, said, call your member of Congress and okay. tell them that you want common sense huh. legislation to prevent gun violence. I and uh, that, that was really compelling. When I opened up my People Magazine and saw right. my name there with my phone number, I said, you know what? That's true. Right. That's what it's going to take. It's yeah. going to take this country, yeah. state by state, community by community, calling their member of Congress mm. and saying, do something. So I'm curious, now that you mentioned that, did you get a lot of phone calls from that? Yeah, we are, we are getting phone right. calls. And luckily, we're able to say... You're on the team. We're, yes. yeah, there you, go. You, you know, you don't need to lobby me. I, right. I'm, I'm on your side on this one. Gotcha. Right now, in the state of California, I never thought I would fly back from Mobile, Alabama and think, it would be hotter in Long Beach <laughs> than it is in the South. And yet it was at LAX when I landed. Uh, we're in the drought, experiencing that. Uh, and years ago, I heard that your father, Kenny, and I talked about an idea of maybe building a water pipeline from Alaska and uh, as an idea you know, to help us with the drought. But when you think about what we're facing, do any ideas creatively come to mind for you as to how we can collectively as, uh, as a state address this issue because it's very real. It's very real and the, the, the weather, the climate change mm -hmm. that's happening, uh, I don't ever remember it being I this hot yes. uh, in uh, October. Yeah. We had a couple of, you know, Indian summer, we call right. them, days, right. uh, you no. know, in uh, early October with the Santa yes. Ana winds, right. uh, but n never this kind of 100 degree weather in, yes. in, in uh, this late in October. Yes. And I think the drought is now we're going on four years of mm -hmm. the worst drought we've mm -hmm. ever had. I think ultimately we in California need to keep uh, recycling, mm -hmm. reducing, reusing our water. And I met mm -hmm. with the water replenishment district before I came here mm -hmm. and hearing about their ideas for replenishing our groundwater so we have mm -hmm. more water. Mm -hmm. uh, but following on what my dad uh, did, I was actually mm -hmm. intrigued by a company that has a permit to ship nine billion gallons I of that, water yes. from Alaska yeah. uh -huh. uh, to California. And right. so I uh, met to, with, with the, this company and just uh -huh. wanted to hear what their idea was. And uh -huh. they would love to ship, they have more water in Alaska than they know what to do with. <laughs> and you know, yeah. we're in the fourth year of our drought. So uh -huh. um, it was an interesting. I think the sticker shock of, of the price tag was right. a little much right, for sure. what we're used to paying for our water. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, sometimes I think our, our residents want us to look at all possibilities for, mm -hmm. you know, finding more water because at some point we're not going to be able to uh, recycle anymore, reduce anymore. I mean, already people's lawns are brown, mm -hmm. people are taking shorter showers, mm -hmm. we're catching rain or I mean water in, in buckets in our house to use yeah. to water our plants so I think yeah. uh, we've already cut our use by 25 percent so we're right. doing a good job right. but at some point we might need to look for another source of, of water to, to get it us through. Yeah and meanwhile I, I was um, as I said again not to harp on Alabama but it was just amazing that the day started out sunny and bright by that evening on a Sunday I saw three cars floating because of the rain 
And, and I it know. Just, it just made me think, wow, feast or famine, you know, whereas some would love to ship us water, here we are, are doing without. Um, I want to, we have two minutes before we take one last break, and you mentioned shipping, and I know that uh, you were very instrumental in the uh, issues that we had with our ports in, in recent times. Can you share with us your thoughts on uh, where we are now and, and what you see going forward for the ports here? Well, we have, you know, the ports of Long Beach and Los, Los Angeles, Angeles makes up the largest port complex uh, in mm -hmm. this country. I like to refer to them as America's ports. Right. Uh, they've had record highs of cargo movement. Mm -hmm. uh, we've settled uh, the, the uh, contract negotiation between the workers mm -hmm. uh, and the management there, so we're, mm -hmm. you know, moving forward. Uh, it's it's the source of our you know economy and jobs not only you know really here in mm -hmm. the Los Angeles Long Beach area but really Southern California and really the country every congressional district in this country benefits from the goods that move through our ports so we need to keep strong we need to keep competitive and one of the bipartisan things that I've been able to do in Congress was I started a bipartisan port caucus. Oh. So I have about uh, 90 members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, and we have gathered around the issue of why our ports in this country matter. Mm -hmm. And as a result of my relationships, my friendships, my leadership mm -hmm. in that issue, we've been able to direct more money uh, back to our ports than ever before uh, from the federal government. So I feel positive oh. about my role in raising the awareness of why ports matter. Good. Well, we're going to take one last break. Uh, we are here enjoying a conversation with Congresswoman uh, Janice Hahn, who is always very gracious when she comes home uh, to join us here when she can. Stay tuned for more of Long Beach Lens. Hi, I'm Derek Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership here at the We Lab satellite location. Had net with them being the media company that they are, with the entrepreneurs that we have that can use such innovations, you know, to better their business. And I think also the vision that We Labs is being given by Padnet with their advertising and then vice versa. I think it's very important for the two of us to be here together. So one thing PadNet offers is for us to make it what we want it to be. It's our voice, it's our channel. And this gives another whole group of people that may not have gone down to the library, that may not have gone all the way up to North Long Beach to be part of, of creation at the site of using the studios. They'll come here. You have the ability to, to come here and check out um, a field kit, a, a DSLR camera, lights, um, audio kit, everything that you need to uh, produce the content to create a program for PadNet. I have freelancers, contractors coming in, and I am building my business here. It has really made a difference between building my business from a home environment and building my business here in a professional environment that is very creative and collaborative and networking. We love We Labs. We couldn't have done it without it. I'm a part of Long Beach Tech, and we would really love to have more people involve themselves in the daily and weekly, monthly opportunities that present themselves at both We Labs, PadNet. The people and the energy here, there's so much uh, technological knowledge, there's so much entrepreneurial spirit here, and it's a perfect fit. And we're really excited about all the possibilities um, that this satellite is going to bring. Welcome back. I am your host, Derek J. Simpson, and we've been having a great conversation with Congresswoman Janice Hahn. And as we were just saying, we've covered a lot of ground in, uh, in this time that we've had together. And uh, it's all been at the national and international level, but there's soon to be a more uh, local agenda for you in terms of uh, coming back home and uh, pursuing becoming our, our fourth uh, supervisory district. Um, 
supervisor here in LA County. Uh, what makes that important to you after all that you've done politically? Why that position now? I think as we were discussing earlier, you know, Washington DC is very broken and very dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And w what I learned about myself was as much as I tried and I did through the mm -hmm. Port Caucus and other things, reach across the aisle and work together, mm -hmm. there, there is a, a um, framework back there that makes it very difficult to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're seeing that in the fight for the new speaker. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that I can do more for the residents of LA County coming home mm -hmm. and being on the local county board of supervisor. Now, of course, my dad, uh, Kenny Hahn, was a county supervisor for 40 years, so I mm -hmm. pretty much grew up watching my dad right. uh, in that job. And I think now it, uh, I'm just I'm better suited for local government. I think mm -hmm. local government is the place where you can actually get things done. And there are so mm -hmm. many big issues facing the residents of Los Angeles County, mm -hmm. like water, uh, you know, like traffic, uh, mm -hmm. like job creation, small businesses, uh, mm -hmm. our foster care, our jails, mental mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. you know, the sheriff's department. I, I think mm -hmm. uh, these are issues that people, um, mm -hmm. you know, really come in contact with and impact their lives. And I believe I can do a much better job locally serving mm -hmm. the people than I can uh, right now in, in this particular Congress. Now, I know that within that district, are many cities and some are incorporated areas. I would imagine that if you can sort of get people at the congressional letter level to come together, that you would use similar strategies, I would imagine, to collectively get people within the county to come together. Um, well, I kind of see myself as a problem solver right. and um, I like to, to find common sense solutions to people's problems. Right. And I uh, do find that I uh, can bring people together and bring mm -hmm. people to the table. And I've always in my life worked with business, with labor, mm -hmm. with environmental groups, mm -hmm. uh, with small business, with big business. I like bringing people to the table and coming mm -hmm. up with solutions that really work for people and that solve problems. So yeah. uh, it's a better environment to do that. And mm -hmm. certainly the County of Los Angeles is at a great point. We have uh, two new supervisors. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a new county sheriff. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a new county assessor. And it's an opportunity to make county government more uh, accessible, uh, mm -hmm. make county government more transparent, uh, mm -hmm. and make county government really uh, work hard to make sure they meet people's needs. And you know, the county really is the safety net uh, for so many people. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect place to really work for those who maybe are marginalized um, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, mm -hmm. the county is really there to make sure they don't fall through the cracks. And I look forward to, uh, you know, being on that board and uh, really caring about people, mm -hmm. uh, caring about immigrants, uh, caring mm -hmm. about those uh, who are in poverty, and right. figuring out how we can help make their life easier. I want it right. to be easier for people to own a home. I want it right. to be easier for people to send their kids to college. I want it to be mm -hmm. easier for people to really have the kind of quality of life that they expect from a county so yeah. incredibly uh, important and great as Los Angeles. And you mentioned earlier in our conversation uh, when we were talking about government and nonprofits that uh, the government can't do it all. So I would imagine a part of your strategy would also be working with community-based organizations to come up with solutions that everyone could uh, buy into, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I can't. The, government can't do it all. We have so many great nonprofits already on the ground. Right. And so the idea is to partner with them and help bring some county resources to the nonprofits so they mm -hmm. can continue to do the job that they're already doing. I think our homeless issue is so important right. and it's really almost to a crisis point. Our veterans who are homeless mm -hmm. uh, is a huge problem. But there are nonprofits right now on the ground mm -hmm. who, you know, that's their expertise is mm -hmm. figuring out how to help people uh, transition from being homeless to a productive uh, member of our society and I look forward to working with them right. and sort of helping them do the job that they really can excel at. Right. And Congresswoman, when, when you arrived today, I was walking you around showing you our agency and, and we met one young man that started out in our program and, you know, kind of shared his journey. But when you think about the youth 
in your district currently and then moving forward in this county, what would your words of encouragement be to them who might be disenfranchised or who are just trying to find their way because sometimes they can't see the future because of the, 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 the burden of the present. What would your words of encouragement be? Well, it was be a very today? impressive young man that we met, and yes. it sounds like uh, he's on his way to uh, mm. you know, being extremely successful because of some of the skills yes. that your uh, nonprofit was able to mm -hmm. uh, uh, give him. And I think when I look around and see all the, the people working here today mm. and learning these skills, I think this is a great example of what we need to do. We need to have more opportunities right. for young people to earn the skills to pay their bills. Right. You know, uh, not everybody's going to go to college, but you know, we ought to make sure that our schools are getting our kids college ready. But not right. everybody's going to go to college, and by the way, there's still a lot of skills that this society yeah. needs Absolutely. that we need to make sure our young people are acquiring those. So I think uh, the best message we can give to young people is just to put our resources in more mm -hmm. uh, after-school programs you know, more job training programs, more mentoring. Right. Uh, we need to give kids a hope and a future and opportunity. And that's, again, right. we are in the greatest land in the world. This country yes. is great. This county is great. Long Beach is what a great city with a mm -hmm. great mayor. But mm -hmm. we just need to figure out how to make sure everyone has the mm -hmm. same opportunities and can see a path mm -hmm. to their own future and success. Thank you. Now, speaking of great, I know that you're great in the public eye, but you're also pretty special at home with uh, family, and I know that uh, the president even made comment once about your grandkids and how special they were. But uh, when you can step away from the pressures of uh, leadership and the responsibility, I should say, uh, of leadership, uh, what gives you um, the greatest uh, sense of comfort uh, to kind of uh, re-energize so that you can get back out here with us that depend on you for that leadership? Well, I think anybody that uh, mm -hmm. is lucky enough to uh, have a family and have grandchildren, they, right. they know uh, what it feels to have one of your grandchildren, uh, mine call me Mimi, uh, to have <laughs> them climb on my lap and put their arms around me and call mm -hmm. me Mimi and give me a big kiss. Mm -hmm. uh, my oldest is 12 and she even texts me regularly uh, <laughs> to let me know she's thinking about me and nothing gives me more joy right. and uh, more really satisfaction than seeing those five darling grandchildren right. and the love that, they, the unconditional love that they have for me right. and certainly my unconditional love for them. It really makes life worth living. Yes, and it goes back to what we were speaking of earlier the little girl that, that ran up to the Pope and uh, sort of a, a poignant uh, vision of, of all the people, of all the security. Uh, right. There were two people that just had a genuine care for each other meeting mm -hmm. in the midst of all of that. That was uh, a pretty special moment. I know. Yes. When I uh, catch their eye, when they catch my eye, when we, we get together, it's, there's mm -hmm. nothing like it. Yes, yes. Well, it, it's been such an honor and such a pleasure to, to have you uh, join us. Uh, we look forward to hearing more uh, as you progress with what's going on in Congress. I know that you were saying you fly back and forth every weekend. I can't imagine uh, how that must feel, just uh, knowing that I fly for three hours and, and how uh, I have to do aerobics almost to just uh, get unwound. Well, it shows my commitment to you yes. know my district and being home. I, yes. I want to be here every weekend. Yes. I think people who stay in Washington, D.C. get very disconnected from right. the people they serve, right. and they get in a bubble, and they forget right. why they're there. So coming right. home every weekend is my commitment to the people that elected me uh, yes. so they can see me, and I can, more importantly, see them and yes. hear their concerns personally. Well, we love it, and we respect you for doing it, and we thank you sincerely for joining us here on uh, Long Beach Lens. Uh, that concludes our show. We could talk for another hour, but she doesn't have the time. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Congresswoman Janice Hahn for joining us today. Be sure to follow PadNet TV on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. This show has been brought to you with support from the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Thank you for watching Long Beach Lens. Thank you.